Et bonsoir, euh, je suis vraiment désolé de ne pas être là parmi vous, mais euh, je, bah, je me joins d'abord à Xavier en remerciant l'équipe euh, technique et l'équipe, euh, toute l'équipe de, de, de la NEF qui a rendu euh, cette intervention à distance possible. Alors, on va tenter. Euh, je, malgré tout, euh, j'ai beaucoup de plaisir à euh, pouvoir euh, animer cette rencontre avec Wendy Tilby et Amanda Forbis, dont euh, j'adore les films depuis, euh, depuis que je suis tout petit, depuis que j'ai vu euh, euh, leur premier film euh, il y a 20 ans. Alors, pour récapituler, Wendy Tilby et Amanda Forbis, je pense que la plupart d'entre vous sont, connaissent déjà leurs films, mais euh, ce sont... Euh, de euh, réalisatrices du Canada qui euh, co-réalisent des films ensemble depuis les années euh, 90. Euh, Jusqu'ici, elles ont réalisé euh, trois courts-métrages, euh, ainsi que beaucoup de publicités et euh, d'autres projets euh, encore. Euh, alors, les trois courts-métrages, euh, à savoir euh, « When the day breaks euh, »,« Wildlife »,« Vie sauvage », je pense que ça s'appelle en français, je ne sais pas, et euh, « The Flying Sailor, le, le matelot volant, qui est sorti en festival l'année dernière. Les trois films ont été produits, euh, tous les trois, avec euh, l'ONF. Euh, les trois films ont tous connu un très grand succès, euh, critique, euh, y compris euh, une nomination aux Oscars par film. Et euh, les trois films sont, euh, pour moi, fascinants. Et on, on y reconnaît euh, un, un, un ton ou une ambiance, ou un mélange de tons... Euh, très particulière, très, très propre à elle, euh, c'est-à-dire euh, leurs films sont capables d'être tristes et comiques euh, en même temps, même en une seule image. Euh, ce sont des films qui sont exceptionnellement euh, sensibles aux, aux, aux petits détails, de, des fois presque banals de la vie quotidienne, et qui en même temps réussissent en six ou huit minutes à aborder les plus grands sujets euh, métaphysiques, euh, comme par exemple la mort, notamment, qui est abordé de façon différente dans chacun de leurs courts-métrages. Euh, alors, je vais vite faire en anglais. Uh, just to recap what I said in French uh, in English. Um, so, Wendy Tobey and Amanda Forbes, as many of you, I'm sure, would already know, are uh, directors from Canada who've been working together since the 1990s. Uh, they have directed uh, three short films as well as many ads and other projects besides The three short films are uh, When the Day Breaks, uh, Wildlife, and uh, more recently, The Flying Sailor, which uh, hit festivals last year. All three films co-produced, uh, produced, I should say, by the National Film Board of Canada. Uh, all three films have uh, had a pretty wild success, I think it's fair to say, including an Oscar nomination apiece. And all three films uh, Oh, very interesting films. I mean, they have a very particular um, kind of tone or mix of tones where they're, they're kind of, they can be sad and, and comic at the same time, even within a single image. Uh, they're very unusually attuned to the, the kind of small details of everyday life. And yet at the same time, they address the deepest metaphysical questions like death, which is uh, treated in a slightly different way in each film. Or also subjects like uh, connection, how we as people connect to one another and also to to the world around us and inside us, uh, everything from the blood cells in our veins to the stars above us. And uh, I'm really looking forward to being able to hear Wendy and Amanda speak more about their, their films and their creative process tonight. Et donc pour revenir au français, alors, euh, pour expliquer un peu la, la démarche aujourd'hui, alors on va d'abord commencer par euh, regarder euh, Le Matelot Volant, leur, film, euh, leur dernier film. Et ensuite, euh, on passe, je donnerai la parole à Wendy et Amanda qui feront une présentation euh, au sujet de leur film et de leur, de leur processus créatif au sens large. Et ensuite, je reviendrai à la fin pour euh, mener un, un Q&A et on vous invitera à ce moment-là dans le public de, de, de poser des questions. Voilà, je crois que j'ai tout dit. Euh, du coup, je, je, on, bah on passe au film, je suppose. Merci. Merci. Euh, merci tout le monde d'être ici. 
Et merci aussi à Xavier et toute l'équipe pour ce, ce bel événement. Bel, bel événement. Merci. Euh, nous sommes vraiment désolés euh, de parler anglais, <rire> mais c'est mieux pour vous. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm Wendy, this is Amanda, and uh, in case you don't know that. Um, and so we're going to attempt to give you an insight into how we work, um, the creative process, um, with materials, etc., as well as uh, the ideas. So we're going to try to speak uh, carefully and clearly so you understand but also we have a lot to cover, so we'll go quickly. Um, <laughs> so, um, the, uh, when we prepared this presentation, we truly were astonished to realize that we've been working together as a team for 28 years, uh, which seems impossible to us, but it's true. In fact, we've, we've known each other almost 40 years. Um, we met at art school uh, in the mid-80s, and we both studied live-action filmmaking. And um, probably like many people in this room, we gravitated to animation a lot because we like control. Um, and animators tend to be attracted to control and the fact that we can um, be in charge of every single frame of the film but also because um, animation is very complete as an art form. It's, it, you work with the visual arts, you work with, it's like dance and choreography, your actors, and um, we, we both really love sound in general. So it's, um, we find it very satisfying and although it's very slow, the rewards are very great because you really are making something out of nothing you're breathing life into something that didn't exist before. So when we were at art school, um, we, were, uh, we were very fortunate because we're Canadian and we had the National Film Board uh, as a possibility of a place to make films. And we, were, we saw these films when we were kids growing up and it became clear that we as young women could actually direct our own films there. And what was so appealing about it was, I mean, we saw some films by very accomplished women filmmakers like Caroline Leaf and Janet Perlman, Lynn Smith. Um, there were lots of women there making films. But the appealing thing too was is that they were making films all by themselves. And we didn't have to worry about film crews and and the hierarchy of, of live action filmmaking, which for us, the creative process gets very diluted in that way. Uh, so that's what happened. So we were both lucky enough to work with the National Film Board when we left art school. I don't think it's like that anymore. I think it's much more difficult to make a film at the National Film Board, but we were lucky. So Wendy went to Montreal to direct uh, Strings in 1991, and uh, I stayed in Vancouver and uh, was the animation director for an educational uh, series of films that were cutouts. So in 1995, Wendy invited me to come to Montreal and work with her on a film that I think at that point was called Inside Out. and. Um, we, uh, we collaborated on what became uh, When the Day Breaks. It took four years. And it was all uh, old school uh, classic animation uh, techniques with uh, the big rostrum camera, 35 millimeter film. Every frame was hand painted. And uh, it, was a, it was an unusual technique. That was uh, one thing that made it not quite classical animation but otherwise it was all analog, um, that whole experience. And then after that, we made wildlife. And um, every time we do a film, we like to change techniques, uh, partly to keep ourselves interested and partly to make ourselves completely miserable. And um, this one happened for us 
right at the point of moving into digital media. And so we spent a very long time trying to find a, a look, a, an aesthetic that appealed to us, and we couldn't find it. And so we ended up animating on the computer and uh, painting the whole thing in gouache. Um, throughout making wildlife and and even before that, uh, even uh, before and after, when the day breaks, um, we've been fortunate enough to have the opportunity to work on commercials, and uh, we work with an agency out of Los Angeles, and um, they've been very disruptive of our filmmaking. It's partly why our films take a long time, is because they get interrupted by other things. Um, but it's also been really interesting for us to have a foot in uh, the commercial world because it has taught us a lot, uh, both technically, um, but also creatively. It's interesting to work for another master. Um, it's in some ways easier because you don't have the stress of your own idea and the, the perfectionism that goes with that. The, the pace of commercials is very fast. It has taught us that we can work fast when we have to. And um, we've also been able to branch out into uh, uh, other designs, other things. Although a lot of the ads are inspired by our films and they would often say, We'd, we want you to do the when the day, day breaks technique, except it has to be done in uh, six weeks or something. And it would be a crazy thing to ask us, but. Um, so then, um, that brings us to the Flying yeah. Sailor. Uh, so this was an idea that we had thought of in about the year 2000, and uh, we just kept it aside for all that time while we were doing other things. Um, so we just want to give you some idea of how we thought of the idea and how we realized it and what was important to us in, in telling that story. So the first thing is the Halifax explosion. Have any of you heard of the Halifax explosion, if you raise your hands? Yeah, it's, it, uh, very good. Front row, two points. Um, <laughs> and you heard of it before seeing this movie. <laughs> oh. Okay, because of okay. the movie. Okay. So the <laughs> funny okay. thing is that not even very many Canadians have heard of the Halifax explosion, but we all should have heard of it. Um, so what happened was very much what you see in the film, except not cute. Um, but the Halifax, if you don't know, is on the very east coast of Canada in a, in a harbor that is very protected. And it was a very important harbor in the First World War. So there were ships going in and out of the harbor all the time. And by some ridiculous accident, it should not have happened, two ships collided. And one of them was absolutely full of explosives. It was heading for Europe. And uh, it was just a little toink kind of a thing. And the one ship lit on fire, and it blew up. And that's a photo of the cloud. And it was the largest human-made explosion in human history. And it is still the largest non-nuclear human-made explosion in history. So what happened in Beirut is three times smaller. So it, it flattened most of Halifax, and it killed uh, 2,000 people on the spot and, and injured 10,000 more. But it was probably much worse than that. They, they didn't really, they were not able to keep accurate numbers of, of what happened. So the amazing, one of the amazing stories in this terrible tragedy was of this guy. This is the real flying sailor. And his name was Charles Mayers and he's younger and probably a little more respectable than our character. But uh, he was on the docks, his ship was in port, and he was on the docks, and he was thrown up the Halifax Hill. And people, and he landed completely naked, except he was wearing one rubber boot, and we got rid of the boot. It was just distracting. So um, people can't believe that he lived, but he had a number of things working for him. He landed in a green space, 
um, the way the explosion worked, it was probably pulling back at that point. And in case you were wondering, yes, all of your clothes come off when you're in that kind of an explosion. So that gives you an idea of roughly where he went. So when we saw this, we saw this in an exhibit in Halifax, and we were just captivated by the, the question of what was the trip like? And it's the kind of a trip that you can make up. We know the beginning, we know the end, and who can say really what the trip was like? So we could make it up. So that brings us to the second inspiration, which is near-death experiences. So uh, as Amanda was saying, this um, story provided an envelope. Uh, he goes up, or the, you know, boats collide, explosion. Charlie goes up, Charlie comes down. Uh, everything in the middle be became what was the meat of our film. And that was exciting to us. But the, um, we looked at a lot of, uh, we read a lot of accounts of near-death experiences. And this guy here was a, a, a Swiss uh, geologist, and he was also a mountain climber. And he was the first person to um, compile a, a kind of an anthology of near-death experiences. Hang on, do, do you know what we mean when we say near-death experiences? Yeah, okay. There, um, what's interesting is that um, across cultures, across uh, um, countries, uh, they're very similar. People report all the same things. Um, and Albert himself had a near-death experience when he fell off uh, a cliff and fell 60 feet and lived to tell about it. And um, I'll read a quote from his, his own account. So he says, um, what I felt in five to 10 seconds could not be described in 10 times that length of time. I saw my whole life take place in many images as though on a stage at some distance from me. Everything was transfigured as though by heavenly light and everything was beautiful without grief, without anxiety and without pain. And that's, um, those are very common things people report um, a feeling of, well, well, first time slows, they often see dead loved ones, they have the sense of perfect bliss and peace, and they even very often see white lights. So, um, the, you know, the fact that we put a, a white light in our film, it's a little bit corny, or it seems a little bit cheesy, if that's the right word, but it's real. This is what, I mean, meaning this is what people experience. Well, however you want to interpret it. <laughs> so another concept that was really important to us uh, was the idea of a terrible beauty. Um, so the, um, this is the work of a Montreal pa painter named Betty Goodwin, and we have always admired her work. Um, and as you can see, they're, they're, they're most often of these figures, and you, you can sense some violence or discomfort in them, but they're also very beautiful and very peaceful. And uh, sometimes they look like they're dead or unconscious, but somehow still there's this peace and beauty to them. Um, and they're, 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 uh, the sense of distress, you also feel distress in them. And she said... Um, one finds beauty in the most unexpected places, and I do not believe it has anything in common with prettiness. There are all sorts of things which are beautiful and strange. Sometimes they are painful, yet beautiful. And we, we, we noted these event. One of, one of those is actually the Wizard of Oz, the one on the right, but everything else is what really happened. And they're all absolutely terrible events, and they are all strikingly beautiful. And that is such an interesting uh, uh, contradiction that, that we wanted to uh, somehow capture that in this film. I, I, I don't think we really understand what is beautiful about them, but there's something very compelling about those images. And we're also attracted to contrasts, um, I th the, the both terrible, beautiful, uh, as Xavier noted, uh, funny and sad. Um, big, small, profound, and insignificant. 
Um, these are things that seem to attract us and seem to pop up in, in our films. And we like them to happen at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> that brings us to uh, recurring themes. Um, there, quite often in during the making of this film, one of us would turn to the other and say, oh God, this is just like when the day breaks or didn't we do this in wildlife? And, and we began to just accept it as um, um, that there are themes and images and ideas that um, preoccupy you and they just come up and that seems to be um, what our films are about. And we, we don't set out to make films about these things, but um, we're attracted to that subject matter and we, we just sort of accept that. But uh, what you're looking at is um, a, a schematic drawing from When the Day Breaks. And um, for those who haven't seen it, it's a story about a, a pig and a chicken who collide in the street and then the the chicken is hit by a car and dies, and it's witnessed by the pig. And um, what, what's interesting about it is that the, or what, what we were aiming to get at was that the chicken's life is portrayed, uh, it starts off as in his groceries. So we see his groceries on the road, and that's a form of biography. It tells us a little bit about the chicken. It tells us that he bought a can of soup that day and some lemons and th that sort of thing. But it's also, um, that, f that film is also about those moments in life when everything changes, these big or small, these moments that can be catastrophic. And that is very much like the flying sailor. It's just this one fluke of, of history, the, this small collision and everything changes. Uh, so. The, when the Day Breaks was very much uh, the precursor to The Flying Sailor. And here's a... Yeah, a scene from that So what we were trying to get at there, thank you, thank you, um, was the the question of what composes a life that we are we are literally composed of our bones and our cells and our flesh, um, but how do you how do you quantify how do you describe a, you know who your grade school teacher was or the influence of an experience that you had or all those things that are really ineffable and hard to define. And those are what compose us in the same way, and those are what disappear when we die. So um, it, that, that is a question that I think uh, 
it's always been on our minds, and I think the flying sailor uh, is also asking that question. So our next film, uh, Wildlife, was about a, a young Englishman who comes to Canada to farm, and he, is, he doesn't have any clue how to do it. Uh, and this is also based on historical fact that Canada, especially Western Canada, is littered with the bones of people who were told they could have a great life farming in Canada. So this is about one such character. And um, this is a, a, a shot from when he is, he, he's had a really good time. He's just a kid and he doesn't know what he's doing and he's not prepared. And at this point in the film, he's becoming uh, disillusioned with his, his life there. So we realized that um, the, the bullet, the flight of the bullet and the flight of the sailor are kind of related. The bullet in this case, it, it represents the futility that he feels, his, his inability to make an impression on the landscape, to, be, to, to have any kind of an impact on the place he lives. And it's that sense of insignificance um, that we also uh, work with in, in uh, The Flying Sailor. He's a very tiny little individual in a very, very large cosmos. So at the end of the film, he, um, he's, he's unfortunately for him dying like everybody else in our films. Uh, <laughs> and he, um, he, he goes out into the snow to uh, uh, expire and uh, he sees a comet. And the comet is he, his moment of grace. It's a moment where he touches something that's larger than himself and it gives him something beautiful as, as he dies. So he, he makes the connection with the cosmos. Um, and so that, again, uh, relates to the sailor. There's also smoking. It's the cowboy's last ride He'll sleep neath the stars On the prairie so wide It's the end of the trail He no more will roam The coyotes are calling It's time to go home only, 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 only. only, 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 only. Okay, so now we're going to get into some nuts and bolts, as we say, about um, making, making a film. Um, for us, uh, let's go back to that, it, it all starts with um, gathering. 
And this is the wall of our studio, and it's only one of the walls. There are other walls that also have images all over them. And we like to surround ourselves with images because they, um, they filter in. And sometimes we put up images that have absolutely nothing to do with what we're working on, and yet somehow they, they um, become part of it. Um, we also collect sound and uh, music and, and that sort of thing, but it generally, um, the beginning starts with images. In this case, um, we found that a lot of our images were circles, which we don't know why, but they were just um, there. And they actually did become relevant. They became, uh, you know, cells or planets or stars, um, uh, portholes, you know, from the ships, etc. And we also were looking at, uh, nope, I'm popping, okay. We're looking at these um, images which are, um, it's, it's called tantric art and it's, um, these, these, these are images that have been drawn for centuries and they're often used in meditation, but they, they're referred to as cosmic eggs and we just sort of love them. And they, they represent the world, the universe, um, basically before the Big Bang. And they are really like the egg from which the universe is hatched. And um, that sort of became the idea um, for turning the sailor into a blob <laughs> at the end because we wanted to just suggest that the sailor was losing his physical self and becoming seamless with the universe, which is what people describe uh, in near-death experiences. So then we had to find out what it would look like, and which we did through a lot of experimentation. When we first started out, we thought, oh, it'll be in ink and we'll do it really fast. We always, always think that, and we never, ever do it. Um, so you can see these are some uh, early sketches. We were mostly monochrome. Uh, and then we started looking at um, uh, historical images of ships and sea, uh, seafaring photographs that were hand tinted and we loved the colors there. So that, that quickly became an inspiration. And um, in the bottom middle, you'll see uh, a, a Polaroid by Tarkovsky, which we found incredibly inspiring. And then in the top left is a uh, Canadian artist named uh, Bridget Henry, and we, that was also a guiding image for us. We also love uh, tilt-shift photography where they mess with the depth of field so that it makes everything look tiny. And there's, I, I don't know what it is about miniaturizing the world, but it's very exciting. And that, that became an inspiration for the city. So these are some of our early color sketches which we put on backgrounds that we had and uh, we started experimenting with putting this very, very pink sailor in the middle of it. Um, and you, you can see a sort of a progression uh, down to the bottom right corner where, which is uh, an image from the film. This was a, a test that we did that we loved and we for a little while, we hoped that we could actually make the whole film this way. This is a, a, a stock film image, obviously very old, and we just drew some flames on it. And so that was another one of our fantasies. Could we just draw the film on top of existing footage? But uh, we quickly gave up on that idea. <laughs> There's just There's not, no existing footage. <laughs> not the footage to do it with. <laughs> So after messing around with uh, the look, um, or actually while we're messing around with the look, we, we start putting everything into an animatic. Uh, we really don't storyboard at all anymore. We just throw everything on a timeline. Um, and we, uh, we were throwing everything in. We would do drawings. We would take bits of existing animation done by other people. We would take live action footage um, including these two shots, which were just stock shots that inspired us. And everything would go into the animatic, and we would start also with sound. We were working with um, 
sound effects, and we were working with temp tracks of music. And uh, the one on the right uh, was very much an inspiration for sort of our central shot of the sailor rising above the city. And the one on the left was uh, just some war footage, but we were just trying to think of what it would look like from his point of view. When we started out, it was so difficult to uh, work with sound while you were working with picture. And uh, when, we, when we first started, really started out, you had to lock the picture and then do the sound afterwards. You could not play with the picture and change it when you liked the way the sound worked with it. You could not do that. So it's been a relief to us for years that that's changed. That's for sure. Yeah, so I mean, so sound, uh, I'm sure you've heard this, they say sound is 50 percent. We we truly believe that. We we feel it is really super important to everything, and I can't imagine editing a film without working with the sound. Um, so when we realized that we wanted to work with, uh, we needed these camera moves. We needed this depth. We liked the photographic image. Um, we our our usual 2D style just wasn't going to work. So we realized that uh, 3D in some form or other was going to have to um, come in. And for about five minutes, we fantasized about building a model of Halifax on the dining room table um, because we thought that would be so fun. But um, we knew that because we had to blow it up, that that would be impossible. Um, but actually, that was Wendy's fantasy. I always knew that was crazy. It was only five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we, but still, the model train set city. If you, if you, if you played with, seen model train sets, you know they're they're really fun and interesting. And that was kind of our aesthetic model for how we wanted it to look. We weren't going for a sophisticated city. Um, so it became clear that we needed to move into CG, something we had never done before and that we were afraid of um, and just didn't know quite how. We, we were afraid of it becoming too slick or just not, not for us. But we enlisted this guy, who's, his name is Billy Dyer. <laughs> He's shy. Um, and he, he uh, is a Maya uh, animator. And um, he sort of single-handedly um, uh, did all the 3D for us in this movie, which was no small matter. So we started by designing this, the buildings and kind of uh, making uh, guidelines for how the streets would be constructed. But it, we, we found this really fun just uh, looking at old buildings and, and replicating them. And then Billy would build the, uh, the shapes uh, based on our drawings. And then we would paint the, the skins, which are kind of like wrapping paper. And uh, we would paint on a wood grain pattern to sort of let the wood kind of come through to make them look like they were made out of wood. And then they would be wrapped and then they would turn into these little toy houses. And so then uh, Billy would start arranging them into the city. And this is a, a real building in Halifax called the Sugar Refinery. And it's an iconic building that was destroyed in the blast. And uh, we thought it was important to put that in there, even though we, our Halifax does look somewhat different from the real one. Uh, and then we did shipbuilding. That was fun, too. And uh, as you can see, it was quite a process from like our original design to constructing it to then putting it in the scene, which we'll talk more about. So then the city started coming together, and it, it still looked rough, but it was uh, forming the way we wanted it. And then Billy had the uh, daunting task of blowing it up. And so this was one of the uh, early tests. One of the first sort of successful yeah. ones. 
and we had no idea how complicated even doing that was. The, I mean, I'm sure half the people in this room could do that, but uh, for us, all the different variables with speed and motion and velocity and wind and all that sort of thing was enormously complicated. But it, it was also a choreography to yeah. time the explosion yeah. exactly the way you wanted it, rows and rows and rows of houses going down at exactly the right moment for yeah. the sailor to pass over them. Yeah, I mean, this one scene took probably a year, all told. Um, so here's the, the rough version of it. And it is, you know, quite primitive looking. Yeah, so, so when, when we got to this stage, we were getting scared because we thought, oh God, it, it looks, it just looks like some it looks bad, is what we're thinking. <laughs> yeah. Crappy computer thing. How are, what are we going to do? How are we going to, you know? And um, it, that's where we just sort of, After Effects, um, we did so much in After Effects with filters. And everything that looked bad, we would add more smoke to it or add more debris. And um, so any pesky things where windows weren't coming out, we'd say, put some smoke in front of it. And it sort of worked. So this is the, uh, just to review, this is just that one scene. So adding the plume, of course, was made a big difference. So the character development, uh, the actual Charlie Mayers was a young man. He was only 22. And we originally thought that we would make him 22. Uh, uh, he would have looked very much like the central sailor there. Um, but we quickly kind of fell for these less attractive characters. Uh, and. Uh, we realized he had to be middle-aged. We needed to relate to him, so we needed him to be middle-aged. And we also thought it was much more interesting if he was, we've all seen beautiful young men dancing, and so we thought it was more interesting if it was not a beautiful young man uh, making these kind of balletic movements. So you can see on the left he starts out young and then just gets older and nastier as he goes along. So we experimented a lot. You can see these are all kinds of different ideas about how he might look and how he might look on the background and what the background might look and should he be pink or should he be yellow or should he have one giant eye, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and this is roughly where he ended up. So the... Um, this, this sailor, the early sailor in the prologue, is all just hand animated in the classic sense. Uh, a little bit cartoony, we wanted him to be a little bit like an early uh, Felix the Cat or something. Maybe not quite that, but we just wanted him to feel... We wanted the start of the film to feel as though nothing bad was going to happen. That it was a fun, nice world and everybody would be okay. It's partly because there was TNT in the story, Dynamite. And it's such a classic cartoon. Um, I, I hope you have seen or know of um, uh, like the, um, the Warner Ro Brothers. The Warner Brothers Road Runner with dynamite was always, there's always, always a, the a big stack of dynamite. So we were playing off yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, meet me. So for after the explosion though, we wanted him to be, um, sort of uh, almost as have a sense of him being broken, but also moving in a uh, hopefully poetic way, this kind of a contradiction again of extreme awkwardness and discomfort. And then by making it slow motion, it becomes more beautiful. So these are some of the drawings where we were thinking about those kinds of poses for him. 
So for that, it, it was going to be very, very difficult to animate it by hand because he changes, he rotates so much and, you know, we're not bad animators, but we're not that good. And so we were looking for ways to make it uh, possible for us to do this. And so we always like to go to a lake in Montana every summer. And uh, we asked our friend Dave to do some uh, underwater work for us. We, so we bought a cheap camera and we had Dave writhe around underwater. And uh, though he did some great stuff, he just couldn't hold his breath long enough for our satisfaction. <laughs> so that wasn't going to work. And then we made this little model and we thought we could use that for posing, but it was way too limited. So then we had to turn again to uh, 3D. And this was our chance to, to animate some 3D ourselves. Uh, Billy made us this beautiful, <laughs> this beautiful character. And we animated him. And uh, it, it, there, was, there was a little bit of a learning curve, which we'll show you how, how bad it was when we started. <laughs> yep. I, I don't know why we show that. Just for the laughs, I think. Yeah, yeah. So then that's the sailor skin rug, as we like to call it. That's the map for him. And uh, we put all the little hairs on there so that we could then paint those hairs in Photoshop. So you'll see in this shot, uh, this version of the shot, you'll see some 2D animation over the 3D animation. We asked our friend Anna Braun to animate his clothes coming off. Um, so you can see the draft version of that here. There goes that boot. So then we didn't, you know, he's, he's not very beautiful. Uh, so we felt that it was important to uh, put him back into 2D. That's what we love to do. That's what we're good at. And uh, we felt that we could make him more sympathetic by doing that, that he would lose his kind of plastic quality and he would, that, that we would feel more attached to him. Um, and also it's a, it's a budget thing. We did not have the budget to play with the 3D. We didn't have the, the, uh, the, the, the people to work on it in 3D to make it what we wanted. So 2D was really the easy way to go. So um, the explosion is the, the central event in the, the film. And uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about um, what went into that, which it, it, like everything in the film, it, our, the film is kind of a collage of techniques. And um, as Amanda was saying, we wanted to combine the, uh, we wanted the sailor ultimately to feel 2D, although the backgrounds are 3D. And everything was kind of going back to that little archival shot of a ship with the fire on it. We, we were still aiming for something like that, although it ended up way more sophisticated. But we were, um, we were still mixing our media a lot, and the explosion was a combination of a um, Billy, Billy blowing up the boat. We had a, an archival shot of, or a stock shot of, a, of an explosion. And then we also did hand painting. So a lot of these abstract images are actually real paint. It was the, the one moment when we could actually do what we really love, which is real paint. But um, sort of just these um, spots and vessels and things like that, um, that are, we wanted them to represent the, um, the sailors' insides because explosions um, have a terrible effect on your guts. And people who survive explosions describe this. And also the ears and the sound and everything is, is, is very vivid. And then we also had, um, Billy did some 3D camera work where he would kind of tumble the camera over the city and we would take those shots and, and 
edit them with and throw a lot of smoke and debris at it. And those are those um, landscape images of. So we just mixed everything together into a big jumble to give a, this subjective sense of what it, the sailor might have been experiencing uh, in the explosion. The other key part of this is memories. And um, in the first part of the explosion, the, the sailor uh, revisits, um, we, we, we see a smattering of images that represent his memories, but they're not really hugely significant events. We don't, we don't even necessarily expect you to know who these people are or um, what they represent. Some, you could view these women as his mother, as his wife, it doesn't really matter. But we sort of wanted to suggest that he was a bit of a, um, a fighter. And a drinker. And a drinker. Um, but we, and these were all done in mixed media. We used photographic backgrounds um, in a lot of cases. And we were inspired by a lot of archival shots. Actually, the one in the top middle, that's one that we, that's some footage we shot for wildlife many years before, just of some dandelions in a field, and we just used them. But we thought that it was important to show memories as they might, that, that we all have these memories that are completely private, that will never, you will never tell anyone because it's not that significant, you know, like being in a, a field of flowers at eye level, you wouldn't, recount that to somebody. It wouldn't be in your obituary. And, and these are all the, this, this private movie that we have that we, that we take with us that nobody will ever know about. And after the sailor um, goes into the sky, uh, so we wanted the first part to feel a bit traumatic. And then we wanted him to enter a state of bliss. And he's, he goes from flailing to flying, and everybody wants to fly. And so he has a moment of truly flying, and it's fun. And then he enters the outer space. And um, when he finally goes into the white light and he just becomes a particle uh, that disappears, it is he's hanging between life and death. And people who do have near-death experiences describe that moment as almost like a decision and the option to die is a much the much better option at that moment because it's beautiful and it's pure bliss and your relatives are calling you and it's the white light is is um, is is beautiful and and you want to go there and the option to live is much much harder because it means, it's, it's wrenching, it's painful, it's going back to your body, which is undoubtedly in pain um, often. And um, so we wanted that falling to be that way, to be um, full of punches and drops and falls. And, and the sailor thinks about all of his life's mishaps where he, he slipped, he fell, he dropped, he spilt milk, he dropped eggs, all those things are, are kind of hard. And uh, so that's it's why... It's also the, a preview of what he thinks his own end is going to be. Yeah. He thinks he's going to go... That's right. So, uh, we, you know, he's the only, really the only character in the film other than the fish. And, of course, there were all these people that died in that explosion. And we didn't want to represent that because it's very... Uh, it's really awful. If you ever read about it, it's just awful. And um, then we thought about it and we thought, well, when you're in a disaster like that, you only have your own experience of it. You are not having everybody's experience. So we justified it by that, but we tried to um, introduce small things to suggest the things that were happening below. Why is there a frying pan in the air? Why is there a single shoe? This fish out of context. And the fish really, is meant to represent those who didn't live, that, that he's lying there on the ground, he can't possibly live. And that he, he kind of is the representative for all of the, the people and creatures who died in that event. So as mentioned, um, sound and music are 
terribly important uh, to us, and we work with it right from the beginning. Uh, we use a lot of temp tracks, and we went through a lot of music, and we completely understand how hard that is for composers. And luckily, we had a, a composer who was very understanding. But So we, we gave our composer this map of what we were, whoops, oh, it's still there, okay, um, of what we were thinking uh, in terms of the shape of the film. And this is, oops, this is him, Luigi Alamano. He's a dear friend of ours. And um, he was so wonderful because he was fine with us giving him guide music and he embraced that. And he let us, um, he would give us snippets of music and then we would cut it up, speed it up, slow it down, play it backwards. <laughs> and he, he was completely fine with that, um, which is unusual. And, and for reasons that we totally understand. I mean, I think to be a composer and be given you know, a piece by Stravinsky or something and, and say, do something like this. It's, you know, it's very difficult. It's cruel. It's very cruel. Yeah. So we get it. Uh, and a lot of, uh, well, most of our collaboration was done long distance. It was during the pandemic, but also Luigi was in Montreal and we were living in Calgary. Uh, so we would have meetings over Zoom and he would, we would be looking at his files and listening to things. It worked quite well, actually. Yeah, it was, it was surprisingly good. And then we went to Montreal for uh, the recording and um, because of the pandemic, only a few musicians were allowed to record at once. And so a lot of the thing was put together afterwards with um, uh, different, uh, like the strings were done in one session, the horns in another day. Um, Lots of duplication. And, and the piano, yeah. And then, and then he would duplicate. And so a lot was done in the mixing studio afterwards. Oops. That's Luigi in the back there. He played uh, uh, the trombone and the euphonium and the ukulele also in the, in the film. And then this was uh, our final mix. And the final mix was uh, really interesting. We, it was actually mixed in Dolby Atmos, uh, which is only in a few theaters. And we were a little doubtful about it, um, what that was going to mean. And we still are a little bit because it's not often that you get a chance to hear something in Dolby Atmos. But when you do hear this in Dolby Atmos, it's quite wonderful. It's the, the immersiveness of that explosion is really great. We were, we were very suspicious about yeah. it because yeah. we don't like it when you see machine guns up at the front at the screen and then you hear them behind you and you, you turn around. Yeah. But this, because the speakers are over your head, it's like the sound rains down on you. And so in, in scenes like the explosion, uh, you are in the explosion and it's very, very effective. So, and also uh, uh, our mixer, Jean-Paul Villar, was uh, wonderfully collaborative and he helped construct things. And because we actually couldn't tolerate being in the theater all the time while he was working on the explosion because it was so loud. And um, it's never been that loud since, which has been disappointing. But, no, that's a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing, but um, <laughs> it was it was an, in, an interesting process. Um, and so that is the end of what we're going to tell you about. Thank you. I'll see you. Thank you. And I, I hope we have time for questions. I'm pretty sure we do. There's Alex. Thank you, Wendy and Amanda. That was absolutely fascinating. Even though it was very small on my screen, <laughs> I felt like I learned a lot um, from the presentation. Um, I'm going to ask a few questions myself, and then I'm going to open it up to the, to the audience. Um, one thing I'm curious about, you touched on the, the contrasts in, in this film. It's, it's ugly and violent. At the same time, there's a beauty in it. It's sad, and yet there's a kind of absurd kind of humor in the film. It is kind of cartoonish, and yet very real, it happened. I'm curious to know how you felt when you first discovered the story back in 2000, was it? 
how it made you feel in that moment when you first discovered it. And then over the years, as you thought about turning it into a film, whether your approach to it, the tone, the way you told the story evolved a lot. It, it, it did evolve a lot. I, when we were originally thinking of it, it, it was more, um, I wouldn't say abstract, but it was cooler, much cooler story than it is now. And we were very, we originally had the, um, we liked the idea of the explosion pushing the sailor up into the sky and pushing the fish down into the water. And then as he lands, they all rise with their belly, white bellies up in the water. And we, we kind of loved that, um, that symmetry. symmetry. But uh, when we tried to work with that just in very early cuts, it, it, every time you went to the fish, it didn't feel good. And so we, we just got rid of the fish. And I think it was probably at that point that we started to engage more with the character and uh, make it sort of, it became very much his experience. It was, we wanted it to be a very experiential film where you were with him and you, you, you felt him. And um, I think it was in that just early when we started editing that we started to get more uh, interested in the, 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 the sort of the dynamics of, of, of the, the contrasts. Although I would say that the, um, the very central image that attracted us to the story was, um, well, what Amanda just said, the subjective experience of a sailor, but also the image, our image of the sailor um, flailing uh, in a, a panic, but that it would be beautiful. I mean, that, that it would be a ballet. And so we, we just, I, I really love the idea of, of a naked sailor doing a mid-air ballet in, a, in an explosion. And it, you know, and it is, there is something funny about that. Um, but, and we knew that we were, that was a fine line to, because it's pretty awful too. So, but that's, that's the attraction. So I, I think yeah. well, now yeah. that I think about it too, yeah. though the the Betty Goodwin paintings that we showed you, they they were always uh, an inspiration, and her work is very much em, it embodies those contrasts. So, uh, you know, I don't know if I could pinpoint the moment that it it became what it what it is. Really, it was a mm. long, slow burn. Mm. I'm curious how you. Uh, structure a film like this. It doesn't have a normal narrative arc, um, although it has a literal arc, I guess, but um, it's essentially one long sequence with then lots of rapid fire flashbacks. How did you go about structuring and timing it? How did you know when the film was the right length? And also, why was it always clear to you that the way down would be quicker than the way up for the sailor? The, absolutely, it was always clear that the way down would be quicker. Um, that's usually the way it is, I think. But no, um, no. no. but it, it's the panic. It's he, we yeah, have yeah, yeah, the sense true. of panic. It's, it's, yeah. But um, um, actually, that's true. That's not necessarily clear. But the the way it was structured, it, it, it's interesting because, um, as you say, the story is simple. There's an explosion. He goes up. He comes down. He lives. Um, so I, that, there was never any debate what that would be. Uh, we knew how it would end, though we weren't absolutely sure how we would show that. But the, the way we structured it was simply by pulling in live action footage into the, and then drawings and anything we could find. And you know, we, there was a film board movie about the cosmos and we cut some of that in and speeded it up so it was the right um, speed for that falling back to earth thing. We, we used anything we could without having to animate just to give us uh, a shape. So we were shaping with um, all real, a real mix of media. And so it was really the structure was found in the editing room with the help of sound and music. And music kind of set the pace. And how did we know the length and the speed well, that changed a lot. That, I mean, it, it doubled in length yeah. from our initial plan. It did, but it's still yeah. we still worry it's too short. <laughs> but also the, the the 
contents of his flight were very forgiving, that it, it could have been uh, uh, edited in a few different ways, and it has a similar effect. It was, it was fun that way. It was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was fun to get away from traditional narrative structure, and what drove us crazy was the prologue, where we had to efficiently tell the story of, of the two ships colliding and the explosion and yeah. choosing the angles and where was he and oh my God, it nearly drove us crazy. Well, and the prologue needed to be quick and because the title doesn't come up and we didn't want the title to come up until we see the sailor flying. So the prologue, prologue needed, we didn't want the title to come up halfway through the film. But anyway, it was just completely um, trial and error in the editing room. It was what it was. That, that sense, I mean, the, the, the editing and the sense of timing in uh, all your films is very strong. Uh, do you edit yourselves entirely? Do you work with editors? Yeah, uh, no, we do it. We do it. Okay. Um, it's, uh, yeah. It, it, Sometimes we think, well, it would be good to get somebody else in at the end, but it, um, it's sort of, it's not even, a, it's not like we make the films and then they're edited. Mm -hmm. they're, it's a constant editing process. It's um, constantly adding, subtracting, adding new footage, taking some out, cutting it. Um, that's a lot of what, um, that's the filmmaking. I mean, that's sort of how it, how it goes. And then you then responding to what the edit is, then we animate this and put that in. And yeah, it's... I see. Um, you spoke earlier in the presentation about how you uh, collect images and sounds. Can you say a little bit more about uh, where you collect them, how you go about collecting them? I mean with the flying sailor you had some circles did that was that a deliberate decision to look for circular imagery once you knew you were making a film about a sailor or were they already there no not deliberate that's that's the kind of that interesting alchemy of mm. of creating things of where you you know sadly it's mostly from the internet it's mostly from interesting things you find on the internet and you print them out and you might not know why you find them interesting but you put them all up there and then somehow they cohere into an idea at some point. Um, or, well, they don't, but they cause you to, to come up with ideas. Um, I, and the, you know, the wonderful thing about them too, apart from sort of giving you just little, just little glimmers of ideas, is that they help you when you're not inspired. They, you know, when you don't feel excited about what you're doing, you look at something you admire and you think, now that's exciting. And it just gives you that little, little lift. So that's also the purpose, is you're in the middle of the process and you're just thinking, oh. And the, these kinds of images can really help pull you up. Mm. But I also think it's, um, I'd be curious to know if other filmmakers do this, but. I, I always think of it as a process of creating chaos and then finding order in it. And that creating the chaos is, has to be a little bit unconscious. So you have to let your unconscious uh, take over. And that's part of the gathering, finding images. You're not thinking about them. You're just, I like that, I like that, I like that, I like that. And then as you go along, you realize that that connects to that. And that, oh, that belongs here. That one doesn't. But that, for some reason, that one does, and and it, it's weird. It, it's like you have to use your unconscious brain, and then you put on your different hat, which is the thinking, rational hat that makes sense of everything that you've gathered. That that to me is the process of it. But you've got to create a mess first somehow. <laughs> I'm going out on a limb here, but hearing you speak about the unconscious makes me wonder whether there might be something in common between uh, the creative process and a near-death experience. Both of them unleash images from the unconscious and they put you very much in touch with I images think, that are inside you. I think that people who have near-death experiences, their lives change um, profoundly. I'd like and, to have one, actually. Yeah, I mean, I think sort of. drug, <laughs> drugs can do the same thing, um, according to some people say. but. Um, 
I think that, I mean, I think, I honestly think that near-death experiences and, um, and, I'm, and I'm serious about this, and drugs, certain drugs, um, create a similar experience. I mean, that's a, a documented thing. And so it's, uh, uh, that's why pe people often take drugs to be c creative for this, for exactly that reason. But we did, we did think yeah. a lot about, um, the, you know, I, I think it's inaccurate to talk about the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain, but we'll just do that for shorthand, but that when the right, si right side of the brain is, is free, it is a very different thing than when the left side of the brain is talking and telling you rational things. And, and obviously, I think drugs uh, affect the, the right side of the brain. And... We are, you know, just what, I think the relationship that you were making between um, the creative process where you're, you're operating on what feels like instinct, it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's partly conscious, but it's not articulate, and, and you cannot say why things are interesting to you. That, that that's, it really is kind of magical, and I think that it, it, there's definitely a relationship there where some part of your brain is responding in a way that you, you have find very, difficult to speak about. And I mean, I guess that's why we make art, is because we are trying to express things that you can't necessarily say in a, a few sentences. Well, and also animation is by nature um, antithetical, or the opposite to spontaneity, because we, we do it frame by frame. Um, it's very hard to do a rough sketch film. I mean, I think we all try to do that. It's hard to do something that is loose and rough and, and, um, and coming from the unconscious, but uh, I think we all try to do that to some degree and not overwork it too much. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we can open it up to the audience. Je vais encore poser une question à Wendy et Amanda, ensuite on vous invitera de d'intervenir avec vos, vos propres questions. Um, I was speaking to Jérémy Clapin, the director of I Lost My Body. I asked him what, which animated film has uh, had the biggest impact on him. And he said, when the day breaks. And when I asked him why, he said, uh, the I felt that the directors, I'm quoting here, I felt that the directors were trusting the viewer's intellect and imagination. It wasn't all clear. And he goes on in, in the interview to speak about the ambiguity in your films. And I think that's something that's very true. Uh, I've spoken to people about your films and they are open to many different interpretations. I'm curious whether you, the two of you seek out people's interpretations of your films uh, after they're finished, but especially while you're making them. To what extent do you, do you need people's feedback and interpretations? Well, we, we love people's interpretations. I, I, often they uh, actually expand your uh, understanding of the, the effect the film is having, hopefully in a good way. Um, with, it, oddly, with this last film, and this was partly due to COVID, we felt we didn't get enough feedback while we were making the film. And we regret that a little bit. Uh, I, you know, I wonder how it might have been different had we uh, talk to more people about it while we were making it. But, um, yeah, we really treasure different responses and, and some of the ambiguities. And, and we certainly are of the school of belief that uh, it's everybody's right to interpret it as they want. And, and these, these interpretations are, are perfectly legitimate and valid. And uh, some of my favorites, actually, are uh, what children say about our films. Um, yeah, some just had some incredibly rewarding experiences, especially with When the Day Breaks, which is, you know, that's a film for adults. I think there are a lot of things that you would think that children wouldn't necessarily relate to, but they relate to it in a very special way, and I love it. I don't have anything to add to that. Wow, I said I it all. <laughs> only <laughs> that it, it is very hard to show your film while you're making it. Um, although I think I fully think everybody should, but um, 
we, as Amanda said, I, we probably should have. I think we could have fixed a few things that we regret, but, um, but c'est la vie. Yeah. It's, it is what it is. It, but I, I'm constantly re-editing that film <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> but anyway, it's, yeah. Shall we see if there are any questions in the room? Is there any questions in the room? Uh, hello, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm guilty because I did not know your work before you talked about it, and it really transcended me. <laughs> I'm really impressed by what I saw, so thank you so much for being here. Uh, I was interested to uh, hear about uh, the process behind using something as horrible as uh, the Halifax explosion into a, a funny story. Uh, how did it go? Did you both agree immediately to make it funny or? Well, we, we both immediately agreed it was an idea we wanted to pursue. And I, th I think all of the humor in our films uh, comes up while we're working on it. Um, and we will one of us will suggest something and the other will say yes. And uh, we, humor makes the whole process so much more pleasant and agreeable. Uh, it's an important part of the process to keep, it, to keep it alive. So humor comes up naturally, but we were very, we, we really, really did not want to make, uh, we did not want to mock or be disrespectful about what that disaster meant. Because actually, Halifax, people in Halifax are very protective of that story, and a lot of them had uh, grandparents, uh, family members who were either killed or injured in it. And so we very much did not want to make them mad, because obviously it's a, a, it was a catastrophe. But we felt that it could be funny, and our personal experience in life, having had bad experiences and painful experiences is that those are the moments that you laugh the hardest, that, that you need humor the most. It is critical to survival. And so I don't think that laughter necessarily means you're making light of something or that you don't care about it. It just means that it's how you cope with it. Uh, my question deals with um, a st an historical detail. <laughs> How is it possible to be thrown two kilometers away and to stay alive? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good we question. Get, we get asked that a lot. Um, if everyone heard that he's wondering how is it possible to be tossed for two kilometers and live. And everybody uh, asked that. In fact, when we started this film, um, uh, a friend of ours who's a doctor, he said, it's impossible. And, um, but it's documented, and it, it's not only documented with Charlie Mayers, our guy, there were others too who flew great distances. And the, there are a few reasons, and one is that it's on a hill. He flew up a hill. That's also the, and I won't explain it properly, but the physics of an explosion is such that the force goes out, and then there's a, um, it's like it creates a vacuum. Yeah. It, it recedes, and so, the, so, pulls there's, all the, so there's a pull out. backwards, and it comes back. Um, so that's probably also what happened. He was lucky enough to land in a green space in a park, and he was also lucky enough to not be hit by junk, you know, because it's like a tsunami. If you're a, a tsunami, your chances of not getting hit by um, whatever junk in the water uh, is very small. So it's the same thing in the air. There would have been stuff flying, so he didn't get clobbered. But um, he was undoubtedly injured. We don't know. We didn't read an account of his injuries. We well, just, we, we we just know that. We did see yeah. that he, oh, yeah, right. he apparently 
we, we, did, we didn't know anything about him, but somebody researched it after we made the film. And they said that one of his um, features was that he was covered in little black uh, gunpowder marks. So he, uh, he'd been hit by carbon or something and... and he probably had shrapnel it, in, under his skin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, and he probably had some health problems because uh, all of your organs just get squeezed so hard that uh, I'm sure he, he may not have lived to be a very old man. No, we know how long he lived. Oh, yeah, right. he, Isn't he in his 70s though? 70s, yeah. It's not bad, it's not bad. Mm -hmm. Could be worse. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really interesting. Uh, you were saying that it's been almost 30 years that you work together, and I was wondering how is this collaboration uh, going on the movies? Do you do everything together? Do you have like different parts that each of you take care of? Or When we first started to work together on When the Day Breaks, it was... Um, we both mostly did everything. Uh, and that was one where we were painting, we were you know, photocopying uh, frames from video and, and drawing and painting on top. And then we would just divide up the scenes. You take these ones. I, I did most of the chicken, she did most of the pig, and then everything else was sort of... And sometimes we each would draw on the same frame. If, if one person got frustrated, say, here, you fix this. and. Um, and we, we still do that. Yeah, we still yeah. do that. And we had to kind of match our styles. And then um, in wildlife, um, Amanda definitely did more of the painting because she hates it when I say this. She's a much better painter. Um, Not true. And especially with gouache. Like I'm, I, the, when the day breaks was more oil stick and I was better at that, but um, better than I am at gouache. So she did started to do more of the painting um, and as we've moved into the digital world so I do um, all the um, editing I make the animatics I work with the sound and everything initially she's always consulting about it uh, but I'm the one that's um, I sort of assemble things I composite things I work in After Effects Amanda does more of the character drawing uh, and painting and um, it's just, it's more efficient that way. But, but I do some of that, but not very much, and she does some of it. So it's, we, we have become more specialized in our own areas, I guess. But we always talk a lot. It's a huge yeah. part of the process is just talking. I, I actually, I'm sort of horrified by how much we talk. <laughs> but it's really important, really, really important. We, we don't disagree very much, but we do. And um, we just keep hashing it out until the, it, we, we tend to work it out. We had a real disagreement on this one about music, uh, a certain aspect, I won't go into it, but, um, and it ended up, uh, I guess Luigi just sort of sorted it out, I guess. But it took months yeah. though, that, yeah. and that yeah. was very strange for us yeah. to not agree on something for months. Very uncomfortable. Yeah. We still talk to each other though. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, it's a rare thing. I mean, um, we often joke about it because, uh, we, you know, animation is so difficult, as a lot of you know, and it's so time consuming. And people often say, I wish I could, I wish I had a clone or I wish I had a twin, like the Quay brothers, you know, the twins. It's perfect, you know. <laughs> um, so, we're the next best thing. We're, I mean, we're, we feel very fortunate to be able to collaborate and because we get to come to events like this together and it's, um, fun and, and it, we share the highs and the lows and um, I think when one of us is really discouraged the other one can help and all that sort of thing so it's it's nice it's really nice if you can find somebody to collaborate with but we know it's rare to find the right person so Uh, hello. Uh, hello. I have a question. Uh, first, thank you for your presentation. It was brilliant. 
And you. my question is about when the day breaks. So you said previously that you liked mixing and like discovering new techniques. So my question is like, what is the use of anthropophism? Like, was it just an like a artistic choice for you to use like a pig and a, a hen or chicken, or was it was there like a real meaning behind it? That's my question. I don't know if it's clear enough. Well, we originally they were originally human characters, and um, uh, we were developing the idea and the technique simultaneously, and. Uh, we just weren't getting anywhere. We, we had the structure of the story. Wendy wrote the story, so we had the structure of the story, but it just, it just wasn't fun. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't exciting to contemplate. And then we just drew a, a pig wearing a, dre a, a dressing gown in the corner of a page and, and said, well, why, why can't we do that? that and it, it, at the time, we were having difficulty with the female character, and it's, it, uh, I think there have been a lot of people who've done very interesting female characters f since then, but we just couldn't get past um, sort of female stereotypes, and we didn't want her to be a babe. We didn't want her to be... We didn't want her to be, we didn't want anybody to care about what she was like aesthetically, what she, whether she was beautiful or not. And we just couldn't get past that. We couldn't get to just sort of ordinary person. And, and suddenly when we turned her into a pig, you know, who knows whether she's a beautiful pig or not. It really, <laughs> it really doesn't matter. And she's feminine, but she's, uh, she's just a pig. And so that solved that problem instantly. And it was also so much more fun. And, and she was more appealing. She was more, exactly. And, and there is that thing that, that where you give your heart to an animal character very easily. A human character, you're a little, you think, well, maybe I like you, maybe I don't. But a pig, you see a singing pig, and you think, I like this pig. So um, it solved that problem beautifully. And, um, and we love animals. We just love uh, playing around with animals. And... Uh, and then we, the, the chicken was next. We had a few arguments about the chicken, but uh, he needed to be a rooster. And then as we went along, we, we discovered that there was a kind of a nice um, idea about all of these farm animals in the city. Um, because there's the, it, it, if you remember the film, there's a scene uh, when, the chi when the chicken dies at the very end where you see a... a a country scene with some horses, and there's a kind of a suggestion that he's gone to, uh, this is his country reward, this is where he goes when he dies. And we thought about how all, all people are, have come from agricultural backgrounds, we've all come from the country into the city, so in a way, uh, for farm animals in the city represent all of us coming into cities at some point in our histories. Do you want to add to that? Well, also the technique of when the day breaks, because we ended up using, um, uh, we were playing with a video printer, so we were videotaping, and then we were printing out selections of frames and drawing on them. That technique only worked because we were turning them into animals. So we were animating on top of these um, photographic images, which was really fun. It was almost like drawing on film. Uh, but the technique would not have worked if they were humans because it's no fun to just, it, then it just becomes a kind of rotoscopy. Um, and, and actually when we've done ads, they've wanted us to do that, which has been annoying. But, <laughs> but we did it for we, the money. But we did it, yeah, yeah. But uh, anyway, so it, it was just uh, a fun thing and then we, you know, we, we sort of made it a musical and everything like that, and it kind of came together, but it evolved uh, gradually. But I think that, I hope that answers your question about the animals. Okay. Alors, s'il n'y a pas de dernière question, intervention, si, ici. I have uh, uh, two questions because there are two. Each one. Uh, the first is: uh, uh, Do you know uh, 
How did the people of Halifax react af after seeing your film, uh, the, the Flying Sailor? And the second question, do you think uh, making only one short film every 11 or 12 years is enough for us lovers of your works? <laughs> Well, I'll answer the second question. The, um, yeah, time just goes. <laughs> um, the, the, I don't know, what, yeah, we do seem to make a film every decade and it, it, it distresses us sometimes, but it's because we do a lot of other things. We, we do, we've done a lot of ads. Um, one thing we didn't mention is we've done a lot of um, projections for ballet, um, theatrical projections. Um, when I say a lot, we've done three of them. Um, and other miscellaneous projects. So we, it, and it also takes us a while to charge our batteries again for um, the next film. And so we are at that moment where we're, uh, our batteries are a little low at the moment for our next film, but um, we've, we're also at an age where we're feeling life's too short to do a film every decade, but <laughs> we're gonna try to It's do crazy. something. Yeah. We're going to try to do something uh, quicker now. Fast yeah. and loose with ink. Yeah. That's what the Flying Sailor was supposed <laughs> to be, but. Um, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. And the first question. The, about how we, we, did, we wanted to go to the festival in Halifax, but we were not able to. And I was very sad about it, except that they had a huge storm at the same time as the festival. Mm -hmm. So I was glad to miss that. but. Um, We have asked people from Halifax and <clears throat> some journalists from Halifax, and we've tried to get um, s at least a survey of what people have thought, and so far nobody has been deeply offended by it, and mostly people are glad to have the story told or to see a different uh, perspective on the story. Um, yeah, well, most, actually, actually <laughs> the funny thing is, is that we get people, If we hear from people from Halifax, it's usually about a detail. They'll say, well, it actually was a lot longer before the ship blew. Like after it went on fire, it was like... It was 20 minutes. 20 minutes. It wasn't like 30 seconds the way it is in your film. And, or they'll say, it was actually on the... Uh, the sugar refinery was actually on the other side of the... They'll, they'll, I mean, they'll do details, but often they'll debate the uh, distance that he flew, which is legitimate it's a legitimate debate because they're you know we've looked at different documents and they're they all say different things so some say two miles some say two kilometers some say one kilometer one kilometer one mile or um anyway, we don't we so, don't know so we, we just know. sort of picked two kilometers it was in the middle but um I, even if it was one kilometer um it's remarkable yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, a world record. Nobody else <laughs> beat that one. Yeah. Bon, alors je propose que nous nous terminions là cette cette soirée en remerciant beaucoup Wendy et Amanda. Thanks Merci. a lot. Merci. Merci à tous. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Plaisir. Merci. Merci beaucoup à Alex pour ta présentation et tes questions. Merci Alex. Merci beaucoup Xavier, merci de m'avoir Thank you very much uh, Wendy and Amanda for your wonderful presentation. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, your Fast and Loose Inc. film. Uh, It'll be coming out in 10 years. <laughs> well, I look forward to it even so. Merci, merci au public pour vos excellentes questions. Je, je voulais juste Merci, euh, ouais. terminer par une petite anecdote. La dernière fois qu'on s'est vu avec euh, Amanda et, et Wendy, c'était au, au Forum des Images, chère Isabelle. Il y avait une carte blanche qui était prévue. Je n'ai pas parlé de, de cette anecdote tout à l'heure parce que j'avais peur de ne pas conjurer le mauvais sort. Et on avait tout bien préparé. Et il s'est avéré qu'il y a eu une alerte à la bombe juste avant la séance <rire> du Forum des Images. Et la séance n'a pas pu avoir lieu, donc vous voyez comme quoi le thème de l'explosion et, et de la bombe était déjà présente. Et enfin, voilà, la, la soirée a eu lieu. Bravo <rires>